Friends, we have come together in this sacred moment to celebrate and give thanks for the life of Stephen C. Beery. Jesus once said, blessed are those who mourn, for they mourn into a living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let us open our lives to God's presence in prayer. Eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, you created us and by your breath you gave us life. We come together today to give you thanks for your child, Stephen Beering, whom you have now received into your eternal care and keeping. Almighty God, you are the comforter of all who sorrow. Yours, the love that never fails, and yours, the power able to turn the shadow of death into the daybreak of hope. In this hour, show us your grace as we reflect on the gift of a life well lived. Help us to receive your word with believing hearts that in hearing the promises of Scripture, we in turn may be surprised by hope and lifted into the light and peace of your presence. And Lord, May your promise to us that nothing, nothing in the whole of creation can separate us from the love of God as we know it in Jesus Christ. May that always give us hope and peace. Amen. Hello, the Bible I'm reading from today was given to my grandmother from her grandmother on her 10th birthday and is addressed to Jane Pickering Beering. Oh, Jane, Catherine Jane Pickering. The first reading from the Old Testament is from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 11 and 14. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, 
and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war in a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work of that God maketh from the beginning to the end. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that men should fear before him. The New Testament reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8 and 57 through 58. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again, and the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of the above five hundred brethren at once of whom the greater part remain this present. But some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James then, of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord.
When I began thinking about what I wanted to say today, I had a wow moment thinking about the tremendous legacy of Dr. Stephen Seabearing. It is a wow moment because we are saying goodbye to a man with tremendous accomplishments. And while for me, he was always grandpa. An innocent example of this would be in 2002, after Beering Hall was dedicated, and for quite a few years, I, and I believe my cousins did as well, called it Grandpa Hall. What do you mean, Beering Hall? We're all named Beering. His name's Grandpa. By the time my sister and I, or Catherine, my sister and I, came along as the, the youngest grandchildren, it was definitely the most relaxed he was in his adult life, or so I'm told. This led Catherine and I to experience a different time period in his life, and therefore a different relationship with our grandma and grandpa Beering. Now, don't get me wrong. Grandpa would always engage in intellectual banter and conversations, but he also came to my karate classes, little league games, listened to musical performances, and watched Catherine's dance recitals. We also watched a heck of a lot of Boilermaker sports together, in person, on the couch, or over the phone. Grandpa asked about everything and was engaged and curious about my life. He always paused what he was doing and took the time to listen, talk, and advise me. He was delighted and proud to be my grandpa. As you know, Grandpa Beering continued to be an ambassador for Purdue long after his time as president. I mean, he embodied the Purdue spirit and culture we all love. When I was looking at colleges and engineering as a major, I looked all around. Grandpa was always there to provide me with facts and fascinating research and projects going on at Purdue. He always was tuned in. And I've seen him do this for so many high school students, always advocating for the school that he so strongly believed in. In modern parlance, Grandpa Beering is the real life Dos Aquis man, the most interesting man in the world. One time at his house, I was reading A Tree Grows in Brooklyn for a high school English class, and he came up to me and said, hey, that author, Betty Smith, yeah, she was a, she was a patient of mine. In early elementary school, I asked him if he had a football I could play catch with at his house, and he handed me what turned out to be a Drew Brees autographed Rose Bowl commemorative football. Grandpa lifted people up. He truly wanted the best for everyone. He naturally impacted everyone he crossed paths with. Grandpa had a life with many challenges, some we know and I'm sure many we don't. He persisted, believed, and became. He embodied humble leadership, not just at Purdue, but everywhere. When I was little, Grandpa would sometimes call me John. It must have been natural when he saw a little blonde boy toddling around. But in the last year or so of his life, he would again say, John, oh no, Andrew. We'd gone full circle. But despite Grandpa's memory starting to fail him, he always asked about my ongoing co-op projects or engineering classes. He'd ask what new buildings are going up around campus, and would always talk about family happenings. I had the privilege to spend a great deal of time with Grandpa during his final year and a half. And you know what? He was always proud to be my Grandpa. And I hope he knows how proud I am to be his grandson. To my grandfather, from the day I started medical school, I was junior Dr. Berry. And to me, he was Dr. Grandpa. In a few short months, 
I will finish the journey that we started discussing when I would drop by unannounced at his house on my way home from school in high school. Mom kept telling me not to do it, but Grandma started buying more blueberries. My final year of medical school has been full of opportunities to reflect on my grandfather's legacy. He was an amazingly gifted storyteller and one of the most humble people I have ever known. Stephen C. Beering was known for his commitment to education. When my name was called at Elliott Hall of Music to receive my second diploma from Purdue University, he surprised me on stage and gave it to me with a hug. While education was clearly a priority for him, the core value driving the work that he did and the life that he lived was people. Education was a means to support and celebrate others. He saw the potential in people and excelled at helping them reach it. This belief in the importance of ideas and developing ideas and people was the thread connecting careers ranging from teaching German and French in college to his time spent in the Air Force and with NASA to becoming the Dean of Indiana University's Medical School and then President of Purdue. He held many titles, but one of my favorites was one he gave himself. When asked what he did for a living, he answered, I'm in construction. When asked what he built, his response was, I build people. Growing up surrounded by the Purdue family, I was convinced that my grandparents knew everyone. As an adult, I grew to appreciate my grandfather's brilliant memory and the attention that he gave to those around him. He had a genuine appreciation for people, their ideas, and their passions. His approach centered on a focus on relationships, practicing friend-raising, never fundraising, recognizing contributions, showing gratitude. He demonstrated a kind approach in his relationships with everyone, but his partnership with my grandmother was unparalleled. They cherished one another. In every memory I have of the two of them walking, they're holding hands. The example they set is one I try to follow in my own marriage. Choose one another consciously and enthusiastically every day. My grandfather's legacy isn't limited to the Bearing family. It was gifted to all of us. I challenge those of us gathered here today and those who are with us in spirit to reflect on the example he set and to honor his legacy by recognizing the value of others so that we all may be builders of people. Many respects, it's appropriate that we gather here in the ballrooms of the Union where so many important Purdue events happened and so many extraordinary lunches uh, before even a few extraordinary athletic contests. We'd be remiss if we didn't thank everyone from the university who has done so much to make this day special, but more importantly to help remember all that was and all that is Purdue. We're especially thankful for the Glee Club's support and participation as they were keenly and very important to both mom and dad. 
Steve Beering was many things to many people. He was a physician, he was a researcher, a skilled administrator, a teacher, a builder of programs, a visionary of campuses, an aficionado of the arts, fine literature, a gifted speaker. He was a leader, a coach, a husband, a friend, and toward the end, even though he pined for mom every day, I must tell you, he was a bit of a flirt. He had a couple of friends, one being the chief concierge where he lived, who he greeted every morning as her blonde loveliness. I suggested that her fiance should hang out with dad for a bit. But to us, and certainly to me, he was dad. He wasn't the dad that you'd go fishing with, uh, not his thing. He wasn't the dad that you went and built things with in the carpentry shop. Uh, but he was the dad that would engage you on levels that you hadn't imagined. Constantly interested, constantly probing. There was no such thing as a boring dinner conversation at the Beering household. He was one who believed in opening doors, and he was one who believed in challenging everyone. It was not why, but why not? There was no such thing as, I can't do that. In fact, he was way ahead of Yoda when he who reminds us that it's not, I'll give it a try, and Yoda who tells us, try not, there is no try, but do. That was Steve Beering. Steve Beering was f motivated by the ravages of war that we can read about and see video of, but can certainly only imagine. He lived through things that were with him every single day of his life. He never went to fireworks displays because of what he endured during the bombings in Hamburg. He appreciated every day every person that was in every day and every opportunity that was afforded him. And he did what he could to give back, which was quite a lot. He approached everything that he did with a compassionate zeal. He approached everything with an eye toward learning. He had a caring approach and couldn't care less who you were or what your status was treating Nobel laureates and inbound students with exactly the same respect, caring, and interest. Toward the end, he faced diabetes, a disease that he'd studied most of his career as a physician. He confronted Alzheimer's, which is a pernicious thief that steals memories, but neither impacted his compassion and his caring. And thankfully, though Alzheimer's robbed him of his short-term memory, he shared many stories that had heretofore gone unshared about life during wartime Germany, early days in the United States, the hard work that he had engaged in to get to where he was, all that forged him into the tremendous human that he was. His passion to make this world a better place permeated every single thing that he and mom did. His passion for people was contagious and has left a lasting impact on scores of people from every single institution he served. And yes, there were institutions before and after Purdue. He left a big footprint for us all to follow. Steve Beering was a lot of things. But most importantly, he was a servant of others who approached the world with kindness, compassion, and caring, shorts that are traits that are in precious short supply these days. Here's hoping that we can live up to his legacy. I never really thought of him as the Dos Equis guy, but that's, that's a very, very
very apt description. So uh, we've all been doing a lot of soul searching and a lot of thinking and talking. And uh, as the family has looked back over the last number of months uh, at the incredible life of Stephen C. Beering, we've had a lot of conversations that have brought back memories, emotions, stories, and impressions. Uh, one of the strongest impressions I have of Dad that I'd like to share is, uh, is his humor. After everything he'd been through in his early years, he always found a way to look at the bright side of every situation. In times of conflict, he was somehow always able to stay above the fray. My favorite quote, which he used often, and many in this room probably heard him say, it's hard to soar with eagles when you have to mess with the turkeys. His sense of humor was dry and evolved, and if you weren't paying close attention, you might miss something that was incredibly witty or funny. As an example, when I came to Purdue as a freshman in 1980, uh, Dad was the Dean of Medicine at Indiana University, and uh, early in my junior year, 1980, uh, 82, 83, I became aware that he was being considered for the presidency of Purdue. I was living at Triangle Fraternity at the time, and note this was all taking place before the internet and Google, which made it possible to ask any question and get almost any answer immediately. So mom and dad took the necessary step of confiding in me and they reached out to me and said, we need you to do some research for us. So I spent a good amount of time at the Purdue libraries doing research for dad, answering some of the questions. What does Purdue do? What are the research objectives? How many students does the university have? All the things that you could find at the library but might be harder to find if you didn't have the internet. So eventually this whole process led to the final meeting on campus where mom and dad came up for dinner with the Board of Trustees. I knew that the decision was close to being made and uh, likely it was going to happen that evening. So he and mom came over to the Triangle House after that meeting where he had been offered the job and accepted it. And he, uh, he and mom came in the front, uh, front door and Rather than telling me he took the job, that would have been too easy, he, he stretched out his hand and he said, as he held my hand to shake it, the name Beering will appear on your diploma twice. <laughs> it really happened. He was a, also a believer in personal development um, beyond the classroom. And I, I think he really, really believed in uh, the whole concept that today is known as STEAM, uh, science, technology, technology, engineering, uh, arts, and mathematics, and he and mom were, were very, very strong supporters of the arts. And uh, as many people know, I've uh, been a trumpet player for a very, very long time. And while I was at Purdue, I spent five years, uh, wonderful years, in the Department of Bands, in the jazz program, and in the American Music Review. They were very strongly in support of that. And uh, when I was in graduate school, I came home one day and I said, hey, during the summer between my two years of my master's degree in electrical engineering, I'd like to take uh, flight lessons at Purdue's aviation department. And they were very supportive of that. Uh, now, neither one of those things became a vocation for me, but they've remained very, very strong avocations. And they've made me a much more rounded person, I think. And uh, the point to this is, it wasn't just about John and Peter and me that he felt that way. He felt that way about everybody at Purdue and everyone around him. He brought everyone up. And he wanted everyone to have all the opportunities that would lead to the best success and the best outcome. And for me, it was a very, very great privilege to have a front row seat to watch all that play out in real time. So when I was a freshman at Purdue, my dad spoke at the new student orientation. 
His message centered around the types of things that the students would find in their backpacks to help them through the Purdue journey. Things like books to build knowledge, a mortar board or a planner to you know, uh, mark down those important events and contacts and friends you'd make along the way. Perhaps a journal for reflection and certainly an eraser for the inevitable mistakes we would all make and so on. He made the point that the backpack would contain those items essential for us to have with us at all times as students to prepare us for the rest of our lives. You know, as I was thinking about today, I think the backpack metaphor had similar relevance in his life journey as well. As Peter referenced when he was very young, my dad, grandmother, and Uncle John were separated from my grandfather when their home in Hamburg was bombed in an Allied invasion. He learned that only things of great importance could be carried with one in a life-changing moment such as that. Perhaps his backpack had a change of clothes or two, the Bible, a toy, perhaps some photographs, only things necessary for survival. While until more recently he rarely spoke of his memories of World War II, it was clear that it informed his worldview for the rest of his life. He was a student of history, and, and he was an advocate to ensure that our approach for dealing with the future was grounded in our understanding of the past. Luke 12, 48 reads, from everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. This was the call he received to become a physician, to serve his country in the United States Air Force, and ultimately to become an educator. I particularly remember him sharing that verse with me when I was in ninth grade, our first year living in West Lafayette at Purdue. And this verse has guided my own life and many in our family ever since. Dad was an avid reader, as noted. He was curious, thoughtful, and displayed an amazing blend of confidence, humility, and wisdom. He loved and engaged in conversation, especially on current events, in, in, uh, in particular over dinner, as Peter commented on. In so much so that when I was dating my now wife, Heather, who was a fellow Purdue student at the time, she made it a habit every day that she was coming to our house for dinner to read at least one of the two local newspapers, if not both, to prepare herself for the inevitable volley of questions that would be coming her way. At times, it did feel a little bit like being on one of those Sunday news shows. These past few months, I have um, really loved uh, reading through Dad's old diaries, notes that he used to prepare speeches, and reflecting on my own memories of you know, the most poignant lessons that he passed along to me in the, the most important moments of my life, for sure. Perhaps a few of these will ring familiar for you as well. Keep God at the center of your life. Serve others and put their interest above your own. Protect your integrity. There is no do-overs when it comes to making ethical compromises. Show up as your best self. You have one opportunity to make a first impression. As noted, multiple of the family speakers today, be a people builder. Talent is the greatest treasure of any organization, and without question, the number of lives he touched is without measure. Be an essentialist. We all have limits to our bandwidth, so focus on the things that are the most important and that yield the biggest impact. Let others deal with the rest. Pay attention to the details, especially in your relationships and how you treat others. And for any of you who received a photograph with a note from my mom would probably appreciate the, the particular significance of that lesson. It was all about friend raising. It was all about extending the Purdue family anywhere around the world. Be fluent in the languages of English and science. And I think that is a lesson that is still poignant even in today's context as our world is rapidly changing due to technology. And we as a nation in particular seem to be losing sight of how to communicate with one another. Preparation, perspiration, and persistence are the foundations to any success. And I would say finally, marry your best friend. I know I did that. 
And without question, mom and dad modeled that their entire lives. What an amazing partnership. My mom once commented to me over, over um, perhaps it was a lunch, um, that one of the consequences of dad's youth in, in Europe during the war was that he really never learned how to play. So my dad was many, many things, very generous, warm, engaging, great sense of humor, but I would never have described him as fun. I think we all took turns trying to teach him how to relax and enjoy friends and family. He got a little bit better at that as he got older. And in fact, it was only six years ago that we got uh, both my parents convinced to attend their first real football tailgate prior to a Purdue football game. Out in the north lot of ross -Aid, just 12 beerings, no chicken dinner, no requirement for speeches, and probably a few beers consumed as well. What can I say? My parents were late bloomers. Thinking back on that freshman orientation, in that metaphor of the backpack, doesn't that really work in all our lives? The things that matter most to us, we really carry all, the, all along. The memories, the love, the learnings that result in the relationships that we establish and the experiences we have. These are the things that define our character, dreams, and passions. I'll leave you with one last lesson I found in Dad's notes. When asked, what is your philosophy on life, Dr. Bering? Dad's answer was, I expect to make a difference. That you did, Dad, and I think we're all better for it. We're gathered, of course, to pay tribute to one of the great individuals any of us was uh, ever or will be privileged to know. But I have to say by way of preface that I just cannot think of this occasion or of Steve Beering without thinking of this as an opportunity to honor an entire family, those from whom we've just heard and others who are here. So much a part of this institution, uh, down to the present generation and up through the wonderful spouses and, of course, uh, 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 to uh, David and John, uh, Peter, all is forgiven. Um, and so we say uh, to each of you uh, how uh, uh, much we have valued knowing all of you, and through Steve and Jane in particular, um, to, to know that you have been also a part of the life of this institution now in a very important way for a very long time. Steve Beering uh, uh, would have led a legendary life, a life worth remembering and honoring in this fashion if he had uh, never uh, come through Purdue University. His was an historic life in multiple dimensions. His service to this nation in, in the armed services um, brought him into contact with uh, General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, in a very direct and intimate way. His service later on and brought him, of course, into contact with some of our earliest uh, uh, astronauts. How appropriate, how fitting, how Presbyterian, Bill. And it's uh, it, it, Presbyterians like Bill and Steve and I that uh, were uh, let it, taught at least theologically to imagine that things happen for a reason. It seems like maybe that one did. But thank goodness that life and circumstance did bring him uh, to this institution. And for that, if Purdue legend is uh, not misleading, we have David to thank. David modestly talked about his role as a researcher, but I'm advised that um, uh, Steve had his doubts about taking up this post and that David uh, pressed him to do so. And if that's uh, even remotely true, then Purdue owes you uh, an unpayable, unrepayable debt, David. Um, uh, it is hard to imagine that, uh, or hard to conceive that a man so stellar was not immediately embraced at this uh, institution, or so our history tells us. Um, the, uh, the immune system, at least uh, uh, temporarily, uh, suspected 
tried to reject this tremendous talent, but soon it became very, very obvious what a gem Purdue had, what a diamond in Steve Beering, and what a record then he went on to build. Um, I'm struck again and again, it happened yesterday, when you think about that legacy, there are, uh, uh, just to take one of the more superficial aspects, but significant nonetheless, I'm struck by how often people say something to me that I think very that few, if any, would have said two, three, four decades ago, what a pretty place, what a beautiful campus. Um, it, those who don't remember can just go back in our archives and look at photos of the Purdue, of the pre-bearing Purdue, and um, it was utilitarian, let's just say, red bricks and parking lots. And uh, people have always had great things to say about this institution, but almost no one would have said what an attractive uh, physical environment. The Beerings and their great successors, the Jishkis, Cordovas, had done so much to transform that. And it's not immaterial as we seek to bring to this place, the, we hope, the Steve Beerings of tomorrow. But uh, uh, every year I get a letter now from the Arbor Foundation uh, proclaiming Purdue one of the uh, tree campuses of the country. There, weren't, there were very few trees here before the Beerings made that a, uh, a, a cause of theirs. When we talk about the iconic structures of campus, so many of them date exactly to that era, the, the bell tower, the fountain, the mall, obviously Beering Hall. The uh, Beerings created at Westwood the lovely home that, uh, that the, those who uh, are hired to my current job are allowed to inhabit I was always a lovely residence, but it was never an asset to the university, a place where uh, people from within and without could come and gather. And of course, the Beerings turned it into that. One night a few years ago, reminiscing about that, I said, you know, this room ought to be named for Steve and Jane. I said, can I do that? Someone said, well, I don't know. I said, well, in that case, this job's got to be good for something. As of tonight, this is the beering room, and uh, deservedly so. Another aspect of Steve's legacy here we've already heard today. Uh, it's the Purdue hymn, to me, is perhaps the, 50, the prettiest 58 seconds of music I know. After every Purdue commencement, I. I, I told the glee club outside, I, I find myself singing it for the next three or four weeks. But I didn't know until I was doing a little homework in preparation for today that it was Steve Beering, lover of the arts, as we were just reminded, who said this place ought to have a hymn, a solemn piece of music. Someone informed him that one had actually been written, I now know by a glee club member, uh, decades before, and it had never been put into service. Thanks to Steve, we have it. It's now one of the most precious e uh, elements ev of, of any Purdue ceremony at which it's presented. Now, for all those legacies that he left us, these are not the real ones. Amanda um, pointed us to those. The, the real monuments to Steve Beering are those people uh, whom he built in his own uh, phrase, people he recruited and whose careers he made possible here. All the young people who came through Purdue and have gone on to do great things, greater because of the kind of institution that he led and, and improved. And of course, Beering scholars, um, the most perhaps uh, significant of all those uh, individuals whom, uh, in, in whom he helped and launched and for whose, for, for whose success he is so primarily responsible. So um, it's often been observed that uh, 
the best Americans are those who come here from somewhere else and have that basis of comparison or came here seeking the better life they thought freedom would make possible for them. If anyone needs reminding of the importance of keeping our nation open to immigrants and the talents that they, that they bring, well, the life of Steve Beering is as good an example as one can offer. And um, if they often make for the best Americans, then in the case of Steve Beering, they made for a great one, a term that should be used very sparingly, but applies in his case. Yes, he was a great boilermaker, and that's a proud thing to be. But he was, beyond that, a great citizen of this country, one through whose orbit I am so grateful to have passed, and I know I speak for everyone here in expressing that gratitude. From a distance, the world is blue and green, and the snow-capped mountains white. From a distance, the ocean meets the stream, and the eagle takes to flight. From a distance, there is harmony and it echoes through this land it's the voice of hope it's the voice of peace it's the voice of every man From a distance, we all have enough, and no one is in need. There are no guns, no bombs, no disease, no hungry mouths to feed. From a distance, we Marching in a common band Playing songs of hope Playing songs of peace They're the songs of every man God is watching us God is watching us God is watching us from a distance. From a distance, you look like my friend, even though we are at war. From a distance, I can't comprehend what all this war is for. From a distance, there is harmony, and it echoes through the land. It's a hope of hopes, it's a love of love. It's the heart of every man. God is watching us. God is watching us. God is watching us from a distance. It's a hope of hopes. It's a love of loves. It's the song of
I suspect many of you feel as I do, it's a special gift to be here today. God is watching, but in my imagination I can see Steve with a smile creasing his face of gratitude to every member of his family and all of you here today. We've come to honor a life so well lived. And as I thought about Steve, I found myself asking this question, what is it that makes for the well-lived life? John, when you called me a couple of months ago and asked me to participate in the service, instantly there was a little vignette from the 13th chapter of John's Gospel that came to my mind. Jesus is on his way to his death. He is having his farewell meal with his disciples. And then John writes with poignant simplicity. Then Jesus, knowing that he had come from God and was going to God, poured water into a towel, into a basin, took a towel, and began to wash his disciples' feet. I would suggest that Jesus was free to serve others because he knew from where he would co had come and where he was going. And it strikes me that the well-lived life turns on our knowing our story from where we have come, what, is, what it is that makes us who and how we are. The, the philosopher Alistair McIntyre once described we humans as essentially storytelling animals. Tellers of stories that aspire to a truth. And then he writes, I can only answer the question, what am I to do, if I can answer the prior question, to what story or stories do I find myself to be a part? As we've been listening today, it's so clear, Steve Berry knew from where he had come. And you did not spend much time with, around Steve without at some point hearing the story how as a 16-year-old boy on a misty morning, the ship sailed into New York Harbor. He was standing on deck with his family, and suddenly a shaft of light burst the skyline, and there was the Statue of Liberty in all of its splendor. And Steve writes, at that moment my father said, there she is the Statue of Liberty. Never forget this moment. This is a signal to you to make something of yourself. And something he indeed did make. As his family has said, he did not like to talk about his war experiences. They traumatized him, but those memories were part of his story, and they made him who he was. One of my theological heroes is a German by the name of Helmut Thielicke. I mention that because Thielicke was the dean of the theological faculty and rector at the University of Hamburg, where Steve grew up as a boy. He was a renowned preacher forbidden by the Nazis to speak, to speak publicly. And so, in the city of Stuttgart, from time to time, there would simply be a poster that would have this message tonight, 8 o'clock, HT, and it would give the address. There's a little book that comes from those series of homilies. It's called The Silence of God, and, and in one of those homilies, Tilaki reflects he says, as people who stand amidst smoking ruins, we should never lose sight of these darkest hours, but we should learn to use them to discern true light. Because, he went on to say, we are people with a future. Everywhere, the surprises of God are waiting for us. As you all have shared reflections, Steve's life was a witness 
to the surprises of God. In an interview in, in the year 2000, he was asked what it was that motivated him to pursue medicine. And he responded, I was so morally outraged by the suffering and the personal tragedies of the Second World War that I wanted to roll up my sleeves and do something about it. So I went into medicine. I went into medicine because I thought I could make a difference by helping sick people. And I wanted to help people in a very special way. On another occasion, looking back over his life, he noted how again and again some extraordinary experiences had crossed his life and made him to who he was. And he described them as interventions of fate, of providence. One of those God surprises as has been referred to this afternoon, was the invitation to become the president of Purdue University. And I have maybe a little different story to tell about that. It was Christmas Eve, 1982. I was the pastor at Second Presbyterian Church in Indianapolis, Indiana, and at the conclusion of one of our Christmas Eve services, Steve, who was like president, a ruling elder in the Presbyterian Church, uh, was up front ready to meet me and he said Bill can I talk to you for a moment he said uh, I need your prayers he said I've been asked to uh, serve as the next president of, of Purdue I, I've been asked a couple times I've said no and then I'll never forget he said you know I'm an IU guy and uh, I'm not sure as a medical doctor I'm the right fit for Purdue. Well, fast forward two months. In February, he tells the story how he and Jane were traveling to West Lafayette for the announcement that he was the next president of this institution. It was a cold winter day, cloudy, when he said, a shaft of sunlight pierced the sky. And suddenly I saw as big a rainbow as I had ever seen, and it struck me that it was an omen of good things to come. And indeed, good things did come. Steve and Jane, what a special team. Every year they welcomed to the president's home in Westwood more than 10,000 people. My wife and I, were, Edie, were there on several occasions and uh, somehow even though we were strangers in a way, Steve and Jane had that wonderful opportunity to make everyone feel at home to make every single person sense that they mattered, they were important, as Steve would greet us with a warm smile, and Jane, camera in hand, as the university's hostess and unofficial photographer would note our presence. As has already been mentioned, when he was asked what he did, he said, I build people. And then he made this comment, he said, there is no limit to what we can achieve as long as we don't care who gets the credit. One day I had a more pastoral conversation with Steve, and I was curious. How did Steve, who was a person of faith, how did his faith affect his style of leadership at a secular university? And we had a little conversation in which Steve said, well, let me tell you a story. He said, you know, the other day a, a student came into my office, a woman, she had one of these bracelets around her wrist, it read WWJD, what would Jesus do? And she was very unhappy with me because she was convinced that I just was not doing what Jesus would do. We had a conversation. And then at the end of the conversation, Steve said, I, I said to her, the question is not, what would Jesus do? The question I live with is, what would Jesus have me do? His leadership was shaped by his willingness to live with that question. The late Dutch Catholic priest, Henry Nouwen, 
posthumously recently published a little book. He titled it Following Jesus. And in that, he noted that we humans tend to, well, we tend to do a lot of things. We run around a lot. We do many things. We wander from one thing to another. And then, he said, we get tired and we just sit down and we quit. When Jesus said, follow me, what he was really saying is, don't keep running around. And don't just sit there. Follow me. Let go of your fears. Dare to trust something new. And the first step now it says is to listen. The second step is to realize that everything around is not mine. Because to follow Jesus means that we do the walking, the talking, the getting involved. We are the ones who have to struggle. But we have a guide, a fellow traveler, someone walking alongside us. Steve Beery, he knew from where he had come. He knew the larger story of which he was a part. He knew where he was going. And now he's home. Home with God in God's house. Where I'd like to think last April, there was a celebration at heaven's gates as Jane greeted him camera in hand. And so I say, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Eternal God, before whom generations rise and pass away, we praise you for all your saints who, having lived this life in faith, now live eternally with you. We give you special thanks for your servant Steve, for the gift of his life and the visionary legacy with which he has blessed us, a legacy of faith and service, a legacy of trustworthiness and compassion, a legacy of leadership and innovation. And we are grateful that for Steve, death is past and he has now entered the joy you have prepared for your children through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty God, you have told us that there are many rooms in your heavenly house. So we ask that you give us faith to see beyond touch and sight signs of your kingdom. And when and where our vision fails, to trust your love, which never fails. We offer special prayers of gratitude for Steve's family, his children, Peter and Shakrina, David and Donna, John and Heather, his grandchildren, Amanda, Heidi, Stephen, Andrew, and Catherine. And we remember Aunt Rita, who was here with us today as well. Amidst the grief of death, we give thanks for all the grateful memories that have been shared and that will live with us the rest of our lives. May those memories inspire and empower us to live our lives in faith and hope, trusting you to lead us through the years and bring us with all your saints to the joy of your home through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
bow into your hands, O merciful Savior. We commend your servant, Steve and Steve Gurney, a sheep of your fold, a lamb of your flock. Receive him into the blessed rest of everlasting peace and the glorious company of the saints in light. And now may the God of peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and God's Son, Jesus Christ, world without end. Amen. Would all in attendance now please stand for the rendering of military honors.